We continue this morning in our journey through the book of James. Today our focus is one of our greatest challenges, controlling our tongues. Today's reading, James shares truth on the danger and power that is held within our words. Hear God's word beginning with the first verse of the third chapter. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put our when we put bits into the mouths of horses, we make them obey us. We can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder whenever the pilot wants, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a part of the body, but it makes great boast. Consider what a great forest con consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a word of evil among the parts of our body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is restless evil, full of death, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Holy God, Lord, we have come into this place to connect with You. And Lord, I pray that You would allow Your Holy Spirit to, to do a mighty work in me, not for my own benefit, but so that I might Share words, ideas that would allow you to, uh, that would be planted and, and grow in the lives of each of us, that we might be invited into a much more righteous place in, in our walk and in our desire to follow you. We love you and give you all that we are. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Many of y'all weren't around, I know this, but many of you remember the great Chicago fire. It happened on October the 8th, happened to be my birthday, 1871. And as the story goes, Mrs. O'Leary was out in the barn milking her cow. And, uh, and as she had a little bitty lamp beside the cow, and, and as she was milking it, the cow happened to kick over the lamp. And that little bitty flame hit some hay, which hit some more hay, which hit some more hay, and before long, the whole barn was engulfed in fire. Well, that fire went from that barn to the next from that barn to the house, and before long, it crossed the river and into Chicago, and, and before it was over, a stretch of ground a mile long and three miles wide was left in total ashes. You think about it, that little flame put most of the city of Chicago into ashes. You know, stories like that kind of get in our brain and they touch us, but, but when you live something like that, our spirits, our souls are definitely moved. I mean, speaking of the Chicago fire doesn't do anything for us. We remember the great Central Fire, the Central Texas fires of 2011. If you remember, it was October 4th, just an ordinary Labor Day. Tina and I happened to be in Aggieland with our boys, 
actually visiting with folks from Bastrop who had no idea what was going on in their hometown at that time. They were there just going about life as, as it happens. And fire officials say there was a, a tree or two that, that happened to die and fall against power lines which created sparks that fell into the dry grass and, and the litter underneath. And from them, the biggest fire in Texas history was born. It destroyed 1,691 homes. It killed two people. And it did an estimated somewhere in the neighborhood of $325 million in damage to just insured property, not including non-insured property. <coughs> if you look at these pictures, they speak for themselves. It's to the, the destruction and the devastation that was left in the wake of that storm. You know, although James penned these words 1,800 years before the Great Chicago Fire and over 2,000 years before the Great Central Texas Fire, he accredited our tongues to carrying the same destructive power. This happened in both these incidents. He said, Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person and is itself set on fire by hell. Now, I don't know about y'all, but not too long ago, I guess it was more than I think, but, but not too long ago, the, the idea of trivia went through our United States. And, and the idea of trivial pursuit was born. Did y'all ever play that game? You remember how dumb you felt after you played it, you know? They had all these different categories like sports and leisure, science and nature. They had a... a arts and entertainment, people and places, and, and even a wild card kind of deal. Every time we went someplace within our family, we would break it out. And one time I was in North Carolina sitting around the table with my grandparents, all of us sitting around, and, and, and we opened up one of the cards, and this question was posed to my team. What is the strongest muscle in the body? Now, my family's pretty competitive. So what we did is we huddled up going, okay, what do you think? And we went through a, a condensed anatomy and physiology deal of the whole body. Well, it's not the ear. What about this long little bitty, yeah, yeah, that flank? No, how about in the leg? And I can't even remember what, what we came up with. It was wrong. But the thing that was amazing to me is, is how our mouths dropped open and how shocked we were to find out that from that game, and this is your first point to ponder, it said the strongest muscle in the body is the tongue. Now, I don't know about the game. I don't know literally if that is true. But I would have to say that most of us say figuratively, it would be hard to deny the power of the tongue. Most of us would agree that there's no greater muscle that's available to us than our tongue. With it, we have the potential to do great things for good or great things for evil. James, in these words that we read, reminds us of the potential that our words carry. He describes our tongue as a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body and sets the whole course of one's life on fire. James goes on to say, no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. You know, from James's point of view, the tongue was not one of many things that we in our life need to find a way to, to gather up and control. It was one of the top things that we need to, to control. And if you think about it, this is our second point to ponder. As powerful as the tongue may be, it's crazy, but we seldom recognize the power that it has or realize the danger that it holds. Stephen Kahn had a blog in April 09 that went this way. Almost every sin imaginable has been confessed to me during my 35 years of ministry. Stealing, lying, adultery, even murder. But I don't recall that anyone has ever confessed to me the sin of gossip. Yet gossip is surely one of the most prevalent sins of all and one of the most severely condemned in Scripture. 
He went on to say, we also gossip just by listening. If the, if the receiver of stolen goods is as guilty as the thief, is not the person who provides a willing ear the accomplice to the one who bears the tale? He said, I personally consider it an insult when someone brings to me a bit of malicious gossip. In doing so, they, they're passing judgment on me, assuming that I'm the kind of person that would re re receive and delight in hearing such slander. But when you think about gossip, gossip is just one of the many troubles we have with our mouth. It's almost as if our mouth is an attractor of evil, of problems. And because of that, throughout history, we've had these great sayings and, and, and uh, words of wisdom that have been shared with us. Here's three. The first one goes like this. Be careful with your tongue. It's in a wet place and can easily slip. <laughs> or how about this one? The bucket of the mouth, and I know people have bucket mouths, I'm, I'm one of them, but the bucket of the mouth reveals what's in the well of the heart. But my favorite was actually shared with me in a, through a sermon while I was at seminary by my, my seminary professor, Maxie Dunham. And he shared, the, he sh shared these great words of wisdom. Be careful what you hide in your heart. Your tongue will find it and tell it. I mean, wouldn't it be so much better if we could find a way to, to have a baffle or some kind of restrictor into the words that come out of our mouth, but it's not so. And so, the things that we think, the things that we feel, the things that we believe, oftentimes just slide right out of our mouth. Never realizing or understanding the, the wounds that we cause or the devastation that lies in their wake. How about the times we get mad, get angry? Without even thinking about it, we can let go of words that cut so deeply and wound so badly that people are scarred for life. And like I said in our children's sermon, it does not matter how many times we, we like to apologize and have remorse, once they come out, they're almost impossible to take back. <coughs> we lash out in anger. We lash out, we reach out in humor. <laughs> telling off-color jokes or, or making fun of someone for whatever reason. Even in our most sensitive times, if we're not careful, just the slightest thoughtless remark can hurt the people that we love the most. As James said, our words are truly a spark. A spark that can set our world on fire. But just as our words have this great capacity for evil and devastation, they also hold with them a, a potential for good, a potential to uplift and create. Our words can give hope and life to those around us. Many years ago, in a small town in Croatia, a story is told of an altar boy named Holip Braz. And one day as he was serving communion with the priest at Mass there on that day, he dropped the gas, the glass goblet that the wine was held in. And when that happened, the priest turned to him in anger and says, you get out of here and don't come back. That boy left and never came back. Philip Braz grew up, though, and took on a different name. He took on the name of Tito and became the communist leader of Yugoslavia after World War II. At about the same time, in Peoria, Illinois, another altar boy, Peter Sheen, was serving communion or mass with 
the bishop there, and, and he too let the wine goblet slip. Years later, reflecting on that incident, he wrote these words. There's no atomic explosion that can equal the intensity of decibels as the noise of the explosive force of a wine glass falling on marble floor in a cathedral in the presence of a bishop. I was frightened to death. The celebrant that morning, the guy that was in charge was a guy named Bishop John Spaulding. And as the glass broke, Sheen said, the bishop looked at me, and with a warm twinkle in his eyes, he said to me, someday you will be just as I am. That boy grew to be one of our last century's greatest Catholic speakers in sharing the Gospel of Christ. He did go on to become bishop, wrote over 50 books, and in the 1950s was the first one to have a television program, a religious television on program, program on TV. You may recognize this man by the name he took, which was his mother's maiden. Bishop Fulton Sheen. You see, our words make a difference in how we use them matters, not only to us, but to the world around us. As children of God, as disciples of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our words hold within the capacity to do great things. Thinking back in the Gospel, Matthew, the 16th chapter, it's there that, that Jesus is traveling through the area of Caesarea Philippi with His disciples, and as they journeyed through all those wonderful things that they saw, Jesus looked at the disciples and said, Who in the world say that I am? To which He responded, the disciples responded, Some say Elijah. Others say John the Baptist. Some others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But then Jesus asked the disciples, Who do you say that I am? To which Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And upon that, that, that statement, upon that confession, that knowledge, that revelation, it was there that Christ built His church. And here's the part of that that passage that I'd like for you to focus on. In verse 19, Jesus said this to Peter and to the disciples. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We forget that through God's power, our words have the keys to the gates of heaven. You see, just as evil corrupts and sets our tongue on fire for destruction, knowing and serving, filling ourselves with godly things, being patient and careful when it counts, it always counts. <clears throat> those things, those words can be ignited for good. And knowing that, I wonder why it's so hard for us many times to find something good to say about someone else. I wonder why it's so easy for us to speak badly about things that happen around us. I wonder why it's hard to find hope and salvation, but so easy to find problems and despair. As we began our time together, I told you, it's amazing to me because we go through this book, how easy it is for, find, for us to find those things that, that we can use day after day in our journey with God and through this world. As we leave this place, I wonder what kind of words we'll share with our family as we sit around the dinner table. Will there be words that uplift, that encourage?
are words that have the ability to suck the air of relationships, children, plans. As we go into our week this week, as we can start playing with the world on the world stage, what words would we use? James closes with a sobering thought that I think would do well for all of us to mull in our minds and hearts. James said, with our tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who are made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing, my brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Can a fig tree bear olives? Or a grapevine bear figs? <coughs> neither, can salt, neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. With one spark we create and bless. With the other we curse and destroy. As we go forth from this place, what fire would we start? Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you so much for the word that so often calls us to a place that we don't want to go. Lord, we recognize that oftentimes it's much, easier for, it's much easier for us to find something wrong with something than to look for those things that are good. In those times that we're met with challenges and frustrations, Our first inclination is to respond in anger and wrath. Rather than with words of hope and comfort. <clears throat> Lord, draw us close. Allow us to be that fresh spring where your love is never ending and always available. No matter the situation or the circumstances.